Can you guys see anything? Oh my gosh. I thought black was good. It's the way it's pops, right? Better or worse? Brightness? A little better? I'll try one more thing and then we'll get started. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to have time to take questions, uh, even though I have a question slide. So uh, if you do have questions, just uh, meet me out back. <laughs> do oh, shoot. Hip chat. Hold on. <laughs> Definitely some not appropriate things in there. <laughs> all right, well, <clears throat> thank you all for coming out this morning. Uh, you're here for, uh, from blue to red. What matters, what really doesn't. Um, before we get started, uh, I, I like to kick off talks with goals. I want you to know exactly what you're in for and what you're not in for. That way, if you want to go see the hacking IAS and .NET talk, you can go do that. I'm actually a little bummed because that talk looks amazing. Uh, so first goal, I, I want to give you a uh, career perspective with this talk. What this talk is about is uh, my personal shift, uh, migration from being an enterprise defender for about eight years into doing enterprise offense. And that has led into uh, a whole lot of uh, unveiling, so to speak, in terms of how I view security, how I view controls, uh, what I think is important, what I think really can just be kind of thrown away. So. Um, that's the first thing that I want to give you. Second thing is uh, practical defense against real attacks. Uh, we're actually going to dissect a couple of, of attacks uh, in this particular talk, attacks that I've actually been able to use that I really didn't understand what was happening before. Uh, so being in the enterprise defense world, you can kind of get wrapped up into, uh, you know, just heads down, you know, doing work all day long. You never really understand or get to see what some of these attacks do in real life and how they're going to impact your organization. So sec uh, third thing is an idea of controls worth investing in. This is obviously going to be uh, my opinion completely. So uh, this, like I said, this is based on perspective over what I've gained over about the last year. Uh, solid advice for those of you wishing to get into penetration testing or offensive security. Pay attention to the green check mark. I'm going to have to go extremely quickly, and the reason being is because I'm, I'm short on time. So the green check mark means uh, those are my tips. Those are things that I've compiled. I've been asked the question an awful lot. How do you get into this? How do you get into penetration testing? These are the tips, okay? And I'll have a summary slide at the very end. And lastly, I talked to a friend of mine, uh, one of my best friends in information security. I was trying to put my, my, my head around this talk and see if I could, you know, how do, how, do I wanna, how do I wanna bring the perspective that I'm looking for? And I asked him, and I said, you know, you, you got a whole room of enterprise defenders in front of you. What would you say to them? And he said, he gave me a very interesting piece of advice. He said, don't leave them feeling hopeless. And, and I imagine if you're an enterprise defender and you come to hacker cons, you can get that feeling very quickly. You can understand what it's like. You come here and you see these outstanding hacks, everybody's getting shells everywhere, and you're like, why am I even doing what I'm doing? And that's a very valid question. And so I do not want to leave you hopeless in this talk. Okay, if I leave you hopeless, talk to me, I have words I failed, I'm sorry. A little bit about me. Uh, I've been doing uh, InfoSec uh, full time for about 10 years. Uh, I used to work for a Fortune 500 company doing Active Director Administration and User Account Management, and have since moved to uh, a company called Cinercom, where I'm one of the information insurance consultants. My current day-to-day -day role is uh, I do penetration testing, internal and external, social engineering, vulnerability assessments, things like that. Specialties, like I said, Active Directory. I love development, anything associated with uh, scripting, C Sharp, Python, PowerShell, I love all that stuff. And if I'm not working in front of my computer, I am casting fly rod or in my, in my workshop pushing jack point. So, Let's do a survey. Help me understand you, because I will change this talk depending on who's in the audience. How many of you work in a large enterprise, large meaning we'll say 5,000 users? Okay, all right, most of you. How many of you work in a defensive role? Wow, okay, all right, just about everybody. All right, cool. How many of you are interested in moving to an offensive role? Two, three, four, all right, all right, all right. And how many of you would consider at least 50% of your day to be productive? I see three, I, all right, all right, I, 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 red teamers in front, hecklers do not count, okay? How many of you red teamers? <laughs> you guys raise your hands, schmucks. Okay, so here's where your day starts as an enterprise defender. In case you can't see that, it says 1 a.m. It doesn't start at 6 a.m. when you normally get up because you're on call. 
right? So you get, your, your, your phone starts going off. You wake up at 1 a.m. We're, we're just going to walk through a typical enterprise day, all right? So you get up. You see to the emergency. You spend two hours out of your morning when you could be sleeping, solving somebody else's problem. It wasn't your problem. And so you fix it. You go back to bed. You drag yourself out of bed for the first pick-me-up, right? This is about the stage that we're all at this morning. Okay, I see a couple massive cups of coffee. That's where everybody's at. All right, so you grab your pick-me-up and you think, hey, this day's going to be great. It's not because you have meetings. So you go to meetings at 10 a.m. All right, and you're like, you sit through the meetings, and then you get to the end of the meeting, and you're thinking to yourself, this day has sucked so far. I've already been up. I've already been doing all kinds of work. I have definitely earned this. So you, you take the long lunch, right, from, I don't know, hour and a half. You, 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 you tell yourself you earned this, right? You've been doing all this work. So you come back to lunch to more of this. None of us are as dumb as all of us. <laughs> Gotta love meetings. No, no, we don't love meetings. So we got some meetings, right? You barely make it through the meeting before the 2 p.m. pick me up. Right? So you, you go grab your cup of coffee, and, and you come back, and meanwhile, if you have to deal with project managers, uh, all this is hitting your inbox. So you yeah, see one guy dying in the back. He's like, this is my life. <laughs> yeah, this is exactly what happened. And th th this is my life, okay? 2.30, crisis rolls around. Another one, right? So somebody calls you up because there's an outage, right? And you got to deal with it because you're it, you're the man, right? Or the woman, so you, you, you deal with it. And so uh, you figure you've earned the rest of your day just killing time on Google. <laughs> and then if you're lucky, you get home for some of this, you put the kids to bed, and that's off to this. <laughs> right? And, and seriously, th this was my life for eight years. Right? And not, not necessarily Woodford. I, I grew into, I, I matured into Woodford. Okay, but th this, was, this was my life. This is exactly what I did. And if you work in a very, very large enterprise, this is probably what you're doing as well. Okay, at least, to, at least to some degree. I see a lot of heads nodding, I see a lot of smiles, and this is basically what's taking place. All right, and, and, and I understand that. Okay, so, um, uh, where am I going with this? Oh, yeah, hold on. I gotta fix this. I don't have my preview. I'm sorry, I should have fixed this earlier. View, navigator, where is it? Where is it? What's that? What's the thing I want? Dang it. Presenter, I want, I want the presenter, I want the presenter view. I have no idea where it is. All right, this, this is going to be interesting because I have no idea what the next slide is. <laughs> All right, so a friend of mine suggested that I take this. And I was like, all right. So I read about the OSCP. I was actually on track. I just got, I got my CSSP a few years ago. I was on track to get the, the architecture shirt, the uh, ISS AP. I, I don't remember, actually don't remember what it's called. So a friend of mine suggested I go get my OSCP because I was losing perspective. And I was like, you know, all right, listen, hackers are really just a bunch of nerds who wear black hoodies that are like playing World of Warcraft in their mom's basement in China. And, and that's, I was a little racist about it, all right, I, I confess. Okay, so, but that, that's where my head was at. And, and, I, and I thought to myself, that's a really interesting place to be. And then something incredible happened, which is we got destroyed on an internal pen test. Okay, this is what happened. All right, Trust and Sick was the company that we hired. I was, I was one of the blue team members in charge of Active Directory at the time, and then a couple weeks goes by, and I, and I see this. All right, I see a Trust and Sick account in the domain admins group, and I was, I was, I was, I was pissed. All right, Th this, was, this was something of a life-changing moment, at least a career-changing moment for me. All right, if I had to put perspective around anything in this talk, this moment is what changed things for me when I instantly went from being a defender into, th this started the metamorphosis, so to speak. All right, and this kicked off curiosity. And a curiosity that I had never really experienced before. Because as an enterprise defender, like I said, your head's down, you're focused on solving the next thing, you're focused on the six projects that you have that you're really never gonna get done because they take years, all right? And that curiosity had started to die off, all right? Seeing us get owned on a pen test revived something. And it really changed something to me. And I started asking questions. The questions started keeping me up at night. Number one, how were all of our controls so easily bypassed? This made me, th this really upset me. Okay, because Dave, Dave Kennedy, was the one who did our pen test. And he's like, well, it, it, it took me three days to, to actually get a domain admin account. So I, I had to work really hard. And I'm like, what? Three days? I've been, I've been doing this for, for years. And I've been implementing controls for years. And you just kind of, three days later, boom, domain admin. I'm like, how did this even happen? I, I was upset. How can we stop this from happening again? Another question kept me up at night. And then the last question that I really wanted to answer 
that, that burned in my head was this one. How, or what did they know as an attacker that I did not know as a defender? I knew that the trusted set guys and, and other pen testers, okay, knew tips and tricks and tools and how to work around security controls, and I had no idea how to do it. And that really, really upset me. That kept me awake for many, many nights. So I was like, all right, OCP, let's do it. So I jumped in, all right, like, 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 like a little baby, because that's what I was. All right, you think you know security, and then you get in the, in, into the offset labs. You're like, all right, I got this. You don't. All right, I spent 400 hours in the offset lags and, and at least uh, one exam retake, and finally passed the exam. And I'm going to tell you something. My perspective changed immediately. Okay, this is what kicked off the transition into me leaving my previous company, all right, where pension, solid benefits, everything was outstanding, and then moving into an offensive security role because light bulbs started to go on. I want to talk about those light bulbs. So lessons learned. Number one, 95% plus of unauthorized access results from one of these three categories. All right? And, and, and if you're an enterprise defender, chances are this is nothing new. All right? You've read, you, you've read reports, you, you've looked at, you, you follow Krebs on Twitter. You, you understand how this stuff happens, okay? Really, one is, three, one is these three categories, system and security misconfigurations. You're leaving passwords and files that you shouldn't be, or in, in scripts that get run on login. Missing patches, this is huge. And I don't just mean operating system patches, I'm talking about software patches. All right, how many of you all have your Adobe Flash up to date? How many of you all have your Adobe, one, one guy raised his hand. How many of you all have your Adobe Reader up to date? Okay, it's, what, let's say it again? You're, you're gonna have it installed. Perfect, uninstall it, I love that. All right, and then failure to file least privilege. This one is absolutely huge. All right, if I get a hold of one of your accounts, and this account is used to uh, power all of your SQL servers and your Exchange servers, and has admin rights everywhere, and, and, and I get the password for this account, you can't just change it if you think you've been breached. Why? Because I have you hostage. If you change your account, you're going to cause a mass outage. All right? So failure to file least privilege. Number two, it was way too much fun. Way too much fun. If you're not having fun in your current role, if you're getting disillusioned in your current role, if you don't have curiosity in your current role, you might want to think about making a switch. Okay? This was one of the first times I had had just an absolute outstanding time in a long time. All right? Every night, put the kids to bed, I get some bourbon, I start the timer, because once you start drinking bourbon, your productivity, this starts to happen. So I start the timer, right, from 8 p.m. to midnight. That was my OSCP window, and that's when I was working. Okay, and it was a blast, it was incredible. And the last one is, a diverse IT background helps tremendously, tremendously, all right? If you, if you are stuck doing one specific thing in IT, and let, let's, say, let's say that you're awesome at provisioning servers, that's great, and that's outstanding, but that's going to be the sum total scope of your understanding, and that's going to be the sum total scope of your risk, your understanding of risk. Everything else is going to be kind of nebulous. If I talk about phishing attacks and I talk about shells, you're going to be like, yeah, I, I kind of get that, but you're very focused on what you're doing. Okay, so a diverse IT background helps tremendously. Now, a uh, little story about uh, uh, why this is so helpful. There, um, my, my team and I, I, like I said, I work at Cintercom. We were doing a presentation for uh, Waukesha... Uh, I don't remember the name of the group. It was a Waukesha ethical hacking class. And we were doing a presentation. We were letting them come in, like all these students, like 50 students, they came in to our building. And we had these little stations set up where they could play and have some fun. And at the end of the presentation, we talked about social engineering. It was, it was great. At the end of the presentation, one, one, of the, one of the kids comes up to me. I say kids. He's like, I don't know, 20. He comes up to me, and he is dejected. All right? And I mean depressed. He strolls up to me, and he kind of does this with his foot, like he wants to say something. And I'm like, hi, I'm Jason. And he, and he, he this, is, this is the question they asked me, and I swear I'm not making this up. This is exactly what he said. He looked me right in the eye, and he said, I just have one question. How do I not be a noob anymore? And I was like, okay. That is the most noob thing you could have said to me in that moment. And my first reaction was, <laughs> disperse ye noobs. <laughs> but I thought to myself, Everybody's been there, and I've been there, and I'm there every day. And so I'm like, who, who am I to, you know, turn this kid away and not answer this question? And so what I told him is I said, what do, you, what do you want to do? And he said, I don't know. And here's a kid who's in college, right? He's getting ready to start his career. He had no idea what he wanted to do. And I said, okay. I, I said, networking, servers, programming, uh, and, like, like, user audits, stuff like that. What interests you out of those four things? And he said, oh, networking. I said, Okay. I said, routers and switches, um, uh, running cables, or how about Wi-Fi? What are those things? He said, routers and switches. I said, okay, you already know what you like, right? Do you have a job doing it? No. 
Are you taking those classes in college? No. I said, now you know what you like, and you will be great at what you like doing. If you are stuck doing something you don't like doing, chances are you suck at it. Or you've just kind of learned enough to, you know, carry along until retirement? I, I, I don't know. Okay, but if you don't like what you're doing and you're missing that passion, your job is going to be incredibly difficult. All right, and so for me, I had found what I liked. I, at, at this point, having trans, beginning my metamorphosis out of the blue team world into the red team world, I had found what, I, what just kept me up at night. I, I woke up thinking, I can get a Mr. 8067 on the whole world. You can't anymore. I didn't know this. Okay, but I was a noob. All right, and so I, after having gone through OSCP, I thought, this is great. This is outstanding. And I, and I found what I was really, really passionate about. Okay, so made the jump. Jumped into, uh, uh, left my current company, like I said, left behind and a ton of outstanding benefits. Moved to a different company where I work with just a ton of really, really outstanding people. <laughs> um, you know, just a solid crew all around. I'm going to let this picture assault your eyes for, for just a second. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know my next slide. There we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and, and so getting into this company, they, the, the first thing they do is they throw me into what we call a bad employee engagement. Bad employee engagement is when you take a consultant, you move them on site, and they, they sit down in front of a computer. In this case, I had a Windows 7 computer. They give you low-privileged credentials, okay? I was working for, for a financial institution, a, a bank, so I had teller access, right? Lowest of the low-privileged access. And, and here's, here's what they do. They say, all right, you got a day. Go get them. And I'm like, get what? And they said, anything you can. Data, try and bypass our controls. Just be naughty, all right? Be naughty in the network. I'm like, this is... This is great. And then, and, then, and then I thought to myself, I have no idea what to do. And so, and so I get on HipChat, right, which you kind of saw. I, I, I get on HipChat, and I'm like, hey, guys, I'm my first bad employee. What do I do? And they're like, find your hacker intuition. And that was the advice that I got. <laughs> Casey, jerk. And so, <laughs> and so I'm like, OK. So I, I start looking around, and I find this. Domain users are all in the local administrators group. And I'm like, well, that's not good. If they're here, then they're probably everywhere, and they were. And so I thought to myself, if domain users in the local administrators group, well, then, then that means that I can run Mimikatz. So I went and got PowerSploit. I got Mimikatz, brought it down, exposed a ton of passwords in plain text, all right? And I, and I took one of the user accounts, and I looked it up, and I was like, hey, wait a second. This user account that I have the password for also has a domain administrator account. You know, there, it was like suffix with like a dash D or a dash A or something like that. And I thought, what are the odds that the domain admin is going to take this password they use to log in here, and that's going to be the password the domain account? It's not going to happen. That's exactly what happened. I went right out to a domain controller and logged right in. And I was like four hours into this, I was a domain admin. And I sat back in my chair, and I was like, <laughs> do you see this? Do you see what I've done? And nobody's walking by to hear me just giggle like, like a schoolgirl, right? So... <laughs> I, I, th I thought this was, this was amazing. This is outstanding. And, th and I'm thinking to myself, surely, surely there has to be more to this. I remember having lunch with my friend Travis here, and, and this was actually before I joined the company. And I said, I said, Travis, I said, pen tests in the real world? I'm like, how does that stack up with OSCP? He's like, OSCP is 10 times harder. And I'm like, really? And he said, yeah. He said, why don't you actually start doing pen tests in the real world? It's so much easier. And, and, and here I am sitting back, and I'm like, now what do I do? I went on, took all their data. It was, it was incredible. It was like, it was a glorious moment. Okay, and, and I thought to myself, surely there has to be more. And as I came, as I came to find, find out, over the course of the work that I've been doing in the past year, there's a whole lot more. And not only is there a whole lot more than just that particular attack, which is not exactly glorious in nature. It was to me at the time. That's because I didn't, I didn't know anything. I'm several months past it. I know a little bit more. Still a new, but know a little bit more. And now uh, what I want to do is I want to get into some of the attacks that I think are really the most dangerous. All right, forget things like... Before, when I worked as a defender, I thought hacking was all zero days. That's what I thought. You get a zero day, you pay for it in the black market, bam, you own an organization, you take all the data, you walk away. That, that's actually what I was thinking. And I didn't know that there really is a methodology to this kind of thing. And I learned an awful lot about that methodology in the past year. One of the most serious attack vectors that I think exists today is social engineering. And I don't just mean social engineering like phishing. We'll talk about phishing. I'm talking about voice-based social engineering as well. I was at a uh, client site, a large retailer, and I, I, they gave me three days to do an internal test. It's like 20,000 users. They, they gave me three days to do this test, all right? So I'm like, you're not paying me to be stealthy. I have my attack machine. I'm jacked into your network. I turned Nessus up to 11. I end mapped all the things, all right? And I'm making a ton of noise. I kick off all these scans, and the phone rings. And, and I'm like, 
nobody knows I'm here except that guy, and he's not calling me. So I answer the phone. Why not? So I, I pick up the phone, and, and I, it's hello. And the guy's like, hi, this is John. Hi, John. Are you port scanning us? And, and I kind of I froze for just a second, and I thought to myself, kudos to this organization for being able to track down the, my, my phone number from, from the port that all this traffic was coming out in about five minutes, and it's, it's no exaggeration. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm not going to lie. He knows. Okay. And, and he said, well, why? And, and I said, well, I said, I said, it's routine. It's routine maintenance. And, and, and this is the part that's going to blow your mind. I swear I'm not even kidding. He said, oh, this is routine? And I said, yeah, it's just routine network maintenance. And he's like, does that mean I could ignore all these alerts? Yeah, you can. <laughs> and he's like, okay, thanks. Hangs with the phone. I went back and took everything from their network. All right, all he had to do was be like, hey, uh, I shut your port down because your port's scanning us. What's going on? All right, a little bit of proactivity first. But in my, in my panic, I just kind of nodded to everything that he said. Oh, this is routine? Yes. Can I ignore this? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. And that was it. And, and that's actually the way that that phone call went. And, and the, the light dawned on me. I'm like, oh, wait a second. If I can just get a hold of people, if I can just talk to them, I can get anything I want. Right? That light is a powerful light. If you have not experienced that, well, well, I'll, I'll give you a taste in a little bit. First, we're actually going to talk a little bit about fishing. All right? Th these statistics that I'm going to give you are from the uh, Verizon 2015 Data Breach Invest Investigations Report, which aggregates tw uh, 2014 data. Okay? 77% of all social engineering attacks involve phishing. Of those attacks, 23% are the users who open the message. Now, before we go any further, I can testify to all these percentages. Actually, now, having sent multiple phishing campaigns, I, I can testify to a lot of this. 23% open the message. 11% open malicious attachments. If you're an enterprise defender, in the back of your head, you, you get this, this feeling okay, that's creeping up, that's like, that's really not good, but you might ne not necessarily be sure why. We're going to dissect one of the attacks that we actually use as a company very frequently in, in our phishing attacks, okay? 11% of users open malicious attachments. 50% of users opened the message within the first hour of receiving it, okay? So oh, here's, here's a scenario I want you to picture. I'm the fisher. I'm crafting the phishing campaign. I got Metasploit Pro, I'm using SET, I'm using Phishing Frenzy, any one of a, of a dozen different tools. And I, and I got my template, I got it all set up. All right, I got my list of addresses, I've done my recon, I got my list of addresses, and I click send. Of the users who are going to click that message, 50% of them click it in the first hour. Now here's the interesting statistic that I read that stopped me dead in my tracks and I thought, we're doomed. How long do you think was the average time from the time that the campaign was launched until the time the first message got clicked. Any guesses? You've read the report. One minute, 22 seconds. One minute and 22 seconds. Blue team, time is not on your side. The minute I get that campaign kicked off, th this is literally what happens in the morning. I kick off the campaign. Sometime between, what is it, what is it, eight and nine? That's like prime hours for, for fishing people. All right, I lean back in my chair, I take a sip of coffee, and clicks have started happening. It is literally that fast. Okay, if you were not aware of this, you need to be aware of this. This is a, this is a key critical statistic, and we're gonna talk about why it's so important. All right, this particular email, let's get into some examples. Anybody recognize this email? This email right here is what kicked off the RSA attack that ultimately led to their breach in 2011. This is what the phishing email looked like. This is an actual copy of it. I forward this file to you for review. Please open and view it. No fancy jargon, no industry terminology, no pretty pictures, just this text and a spreadsheet. And they sent it from webmaster at beyond.com, because that's legit, sent it to a bunch of RSA people. It went into their junk mail. One guy was looking through his junk mail, pulled it out, and said, oh, an attachment. Double click. In this case, the attachment contained it in, his, uh, in Adobe... Uh, I think it was a flash zero day exploit, which created a reverse shell back to a system, or back to the attacker system, and that is actually what in, that, that's what gave attackers a foothold into RSA was social engineering. All right, let's get into a, a few actual examples here. This is uh, something that I sent, I don't know, probably eight nine months ago. If you're having trouble reading it, if you're not familiar with ShareFile, ShareFile is basically Citrix's secure way of sending files, and all this says is, hey, uh, 
uh, we're reducing expenses, and this spreadsheet contains Q2 salary adjustments. Please review it, but keep it confidential. Now, who's not going to click on that? If you get an email that says uh, your salary is going to get adjusted, all right, you, you, you're going to panic. You're going to open that email. You're going to see something like, okay? You're going to start looking through, and you're going to find your name. You're like, shoot, my name is on this, okay? And there's my title, and then it says enable content, see the salary adjustment. Well, the enable content button's right there. You click, you click enable content. What happens the minute that you do that? This macro executes. Okay, like I said, this is a real attack that we use in, in, in a lot of our phishing campaigns. And oh, by the way, these are attacks that actually get kicked off uh, in, in the what, all right? So what I want you to pay attention to is this line right here. Now, as you're going to see, there's not a whole lot of magic that goes into something like this. All this does, all, all this uh, text up here does is kick off a new process. The process fires PowerShell in a hidden window, bypassing whatever scope you currently have set, because that's what PowerShell lets you do. All right, we're running something called IEX. I'll get to that in a minute. You're grabbing a new object. You're downloading it from my evil IP address. You're getting this PS1 file. All right, IEX stands for invoke expression. So you're going to get this. And so all invoke expression means is grab, grab something and run it. And that's it. So in one line, I'm taking this evil code and I'm running it on your system. What does that evil code do? It does this. It kicks off invoke shell code, which runs a payload, a Windows interpreter payload, back to my IP address on port 443, because you're probably allowing that outbound. All right. And now I have a reverse shell back in your system. Now, defenders, if you're thinking in the back of your mind, oh, wait a second, AV is going to protect me. <laughs> it won't. AV, uh, actually, I ran uh, both the uh, ps one file, as well as this attachment through, I think I, I, think I ran it through Razor Scanner, uh, 059 detected this. Okay, so this bypasses all AV immediately. All right, here's another example. Have a look at this one, EFAX. This is the standard stock default template that comes with Phishing Frenzy. Now, what's interesting about this, okay, the naughtiness is kind of the domain, fax-email.us is the domain that we own. All right, you can blacklist if you want, we'll just buy another one, it's no problem. So, you know, if I send EFAX, I'm not going to send this to your IT admins. Don't think for one minute that I'm going to send this to a domain administrator. Right, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to send this to your mortgage officers or your loan officers or some financial person. Why am I going to do that? Well, because they're going to see EFAX and they're going to think PDF, which leads to uh, uh, applications, which is assigned application, which is commission. And they're going to click it. All right, in this case, 75% of users that I sent this to clicked it. And, and then clicked it repeatedly. In fact, this first campaign failed. I sent a follow-up, a second attempt, and, and like 80% of you, they start forwarding it. 80% of you just clicked it. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Is it really that simple? So here, here's an example. This example is crazy. Have a look at this. I'll just give you a minute to take this in. A company, a very, a, a large company that we were working for said, Jason, I don't want you to come up with a template. I'm gonna give you a template, all right? And I want you to use this. And I open up this template and I look at it, I'm like, Pfft. And I laugh. I'm like, nobody is going to click on this. Do you see the hilariously wrong thing in this email? It, I'll give you a hint. It's not scheduled pickup, even though they, they deliberately wanted that. What is the thing that's so unbelievable with this email? What's the logo? FedEx. Who is it from? United States Postal Service. And I'm like, nobody's going to click on this. And I'm like, just send it. 11% of people clicked on it. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And in this case, 11% amounted to like almost 500 people. Sent, we, we, we fished a lot of people in that campaign. Almost 500 people just, just clicked on. I'm like, I was having a hard time with this. I was having a hard time with these realizations. Okay, one last example. And there's a whole story behind this that, that, that I'm going to tell you about, okay, that involved me, social engineering company, to bypass their time-based two-factor VPN solution. This is the email that kicked it off. You might be having a hard time reading it, so I'll just give you a heads up. Basically, it says, uh, due to the merger, which I found about online because they were broadcasting on their website. Due to the merger, we made some adjustments in VPN. We have to accommodate new connections. Click here to verify your VPN access. When you click on this, I had cloned their Citrix VPN portal, which was <clears throat> username, password, and passcode. Like I said, this, this was a two-factor VPN solution. Okay, And so the point of it was get users to go out there, put in their username, put in their password, put in their passcode, and then I can log in to said solution into the real website as that user. Okay. Well, here's what ended up happening. I sent that out, and three people submitted their credentials. Three people. The first two people, this is mind-blowing, submitted the username and password, but no passcode. 
I thought to myself, you don't have a token, but you entered your password into the field? Yes, they did. And so the last person submitted the username, password, and passcode, except I was at breakfast, bacon and eggs, and I did not see the uh, uh, alert command on my phone. And so I missed my window completely. Failure, I'm not going to have my failure, okay? So I'm sitting at breakfast. This alert comes in. I go and I grab the username, password, and passcode, and I, I see it an hour later, and I'm giddy because I'm like, ah, I got you. So I go over to, the, to the, their actual VPN solution, and I put in the username, and put in their password, I put in their passcode, and it says it's valid credentials. And I'm like, well, what happened? I was kind of frustrated here. So I also had an Outlook Web Access instance that was just username and password. So I took this person's username and I took their password and I put in Outlook Web Access and it said invalid credentials. And I'm like, what's going on? Well, what I didn't know was that my contact actually emailed me later. I was testing their security team in the blind. They had no idea they were being tested, which is an awesome way to do a pen test if you've never done that. The security team had no idea they were being tested. And the contact that I was working with emailed me and said, hey, Jason, you're busted. They found you. Okay, Here, here's what happened. They did a who is on the, on the domain that you registered, and you left it listed, listed at Cinercom for one of the technical contacts. And I'm like, shoot. And so in GoDaddy, right, you have, like, you have the, the administrative contact, which I changed to Miles Dyson, works for Cyberdyne. No, nobody got that reference. It's Terminator. Come on, people. So anyways, so I changed to that, and I forgot to hit the checkbox, which says uh, update all the other registrar information, the technical contact and all that. So there's Miles Dyson on the front, and then everything else is Cinercom. And they're like, you're, you're, you're busted. And I'm like, oh, crap. So what happened was they emailed all their people. Now, the, the security team hadn't quite caught on yet to what I was doing necessarily. They emailed all their people, and they said they, this company did an outstanding job. They did, they did so much due diligence on their part. They figured out who got fished. They emailed their people immediately and said, hey, we're being, this is a targeted attack. All right, Don't click on any emails if, if you see anything about a merger. And they found out who clicked the link, and then they found out who submitted their credentials. And then they emailed those people. They actually they, they went to their desk and said, change your password right now. Okay? I was impressed. I was very impressed. Very few companies had this kind of response. All right? So I had this person's username. I had their password. And I had knowledge that the password was changed. Okay? So I took this person's password. And here was the form factor to it. Have a look. This is not what her actual password was. But this is the form factor to it. What do you think it got changed to? Close, close, close. Two, three, four, five. Just incremented the number. How do I know this? I had access to Outlook Web Access. In her case, the mailbox was not set up, but it did tell me, thank you for logging in, but your mailbox is not set up. So I'm like, oh, goody. Now I have a username and password. Okay. Remember, I haven't done a whole lot of technical tomfoolery magic yet. This is just social engineering. Okay. So now I have her password. And, I'm, and the company emails me. Remember what I said, that they found out who I was through who is? Well, in the text of that email, she said to me, she said to me, you know, Jason, they, they found out that it was Cinercom. Could you really just try and be a little more stealthy? I, s I swear. And I'm like, are you telling me to, be, to try harder? <laughs> now I'm mad. And, I, and so I, I said to her, I was like, all right. I got her on the phone. And I said, can I call your users? And she's like, well, I mean, yeah. Like, why would you call them? I was like, well, I want to call them under pretext. And, and she said, well, they're not going to give you their password. I'm like, that's fine. I have their password. Okay, like no problem. I, I, I just want to call. Her. Can I do that? And she said, sure. I said, okay. So I remembered something <clears throat> that my son taught me about security. I have a little three year old son. His name is James. And James has a pair of black spandex uh, long johns. And he was wearing these long johns, we call his ninja suit. And he was wearing mud puddle boots and he was carrying a sword, a little wooden sword. And he was standing out in the front sidewalk like this, hand out, like that. <laughs> All right? And my wife is walking up the sidewalk. And James, here's, here's what James says to her in his little broken English. He wants to say, stop, what's the password? But it comes out like this, pop, what's the iPad? <laughs> and my wife says, I don't know, what is it? And James said, E-I-E-I-O. And my wife said, E-I-E-I-O. And James said, OK. <laughs> so the moral of the story is, if you want to know the password, you just ask for it. Right? So in this case, I wanted to know a passcode, so I called the user, and I asked for it. All right? And so I want to play the call. Now, I, I need to set up the call just a little bit. I called the user. Now, this particular company had two VPN solutions in place in production simultaneously. Both of them were using two-factor. I did not know necessarily which one was the right one. So you're going to hear me in the call 
trying to kind of foobar my way around that and, and see if I can try both systems out at the same time. All I know about this user is I Googled her name, I found out a brochure online, and I got her direct line, okay? And then I went out to LinkedIn and I found a network administrator in that company because they told me to try harder, so I'm gonna try harder. This is gonna be great, all right? So the pretext that I used was I'm the network administrator and I'm trying to protect you because you got fished, okay? That, so that, that, that was me trying harder. So I'm gonna play the call for you and I need you to pay attention carefully because there's a few very specific things that I tried to do during that call to make this user feel more comfortable, all right? You ready for this? Here we go. And fail. I got nothing. You got something? It's, uh, we've been told to call everybody who's been, who's oh, been targeted. As you did it. Nice. All right, here we go. Let's try it again. Sorry about that. I just had somebody at my desk. No, 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 no problem at all. I'm just hoping I'd take a couple minutes. Um, what I had to do was, uh, we've been told to call everybody who's been who's been targeted as part of the attack and make some changes to their VPN account so that it's a little more secure. So that way, when they when they get logged in, it's not so easy for an attacker to uh, target some of our users. So what I want to do is I want to take, I don't know, just a couple minutes and make a couple changes to your VPN account, but I need you to verify your PIN code. I don't need your password, but I do need your PIN code. Is that something that you have that you have time to work with me on? Do you have your token with you by chance? My, my VPN PIN code. Hmm. I don't know what my Like when, when, you, when you pull up your token, you should get prompted to put in a password, and then it should give you a code that you used to put into the website. Oh, yeah, you know so, the, so the, uh, the token that's on my phone. Yes. Yep. Okay. And who am I speaking with now that I'm all paranoid? My name is no, 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 no. And, and, and you should be. <laughs> you totally should That's be. That's why I put you on hold. I'm like, this is our, our, our phone number, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know. Because I never, I never open all those emails, and I was, like, so proud of myself because I, I never typically, <laughs> I was so close to the branch <laughs> that I typically never use the whole VPN thing. And I just had done it, like, a couple weeks before, and then I'm like, sure, now the one time I'm thinking I'm in the good. Right. <laughs> So okay. let, let me ask you this question. We're, we're in the middle of cutting over users to a new VPN solution. Are you using the old one or the new one? So the old one, you go out or the new one is Which Sorry. one are you using? I don't know because I only use it. Wait a second. I go through. You know what I is really it the one? It, does it have the black background with a pretty looking blue lock or does it have a white background? You know, I honestly have only used it like probably once. Okay. Um, so no, no problem, no problem, no problem. What I'm what I'm going to do then is I'm going to test it in both systems just to make sure if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's fine. So, okay, what? Like I said, I don't need your username or anything like that. I I just need um, the 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 passcode that you would put in. It's probably going to be a six or seven uh, digit number. Okay, so I I just pulled it up. So you want me to give it to you? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All righty. I am good to go. Thank you so much. No problem. Your account has been changed, so you should be squared away. Okay, great. Thank you. You have a great holiday. Take care. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye now. Why did that work? Why did that work? What, what were a few things that happened during that call that led her to give up that information? Yeah. Yes, context. Absolutely. So I had current knowledge of what had just happened, right? Yep. Okay. In the back, sure. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was. I was warm. I was friendly. I wasn't. I wasn't like, hey, click this link. Or I'm gonna kill your family. I'm. Mean, I'm not gonna do that. Warm and friendly, sir. In the, in the gray. That's what I wanted. I told her specifically. I said, I don't want your password. Why is that important? I'm confirming her internal security policy, right? Yeah, sure. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. I'm, friend, I'm, friendly, I'm a friendly network admin here to help you, and I think you're great. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, a absolutely. So I was, I was specific, all right? You, you guys are doing great. So, I was really after what was said in the back, which was that I'm going to confirm your security policy. I'm going to make sure that you can trust me because I'm going to confirm what your company is telling you. All right? How many of you have ever been subject to a, a voice-based phishing attack that you're aware of? 
one hand goes up. I have a feeling, two hands go up. I have a feeling all of your companies have at some point in time had somebody call them trying to solicit information from you. Okay, why? Because in, in this particular case, I was friendly. I wasn't confrontational, all right? I, I wanted to leave that user thinking that she had just done the right thing for security. Now, here's what's interesting about this. The minute I got off the phone with her, she called the director of security and said, I think I just got, I, I think this guy just like, took my password. She started freaking out, all right? This is actually what happened. He freaks out and says, I can't believe you did that. I'm just like, red or the riot actor. I, I started to cry. I, was, I felt really bad, okay? <clears throat> And so here's what they did. This company was on top of it. They knew they were getting phished. They knew that somebody had just called one of their phished users and asked for the pin code. What did they do? I'm gonna tell you, they did the exact right thing. They shut down all external access, all of it. All VPN, all Outlook web access, they turned off everything. And so by the time I actually got the Citrix client downloaded and, and installed, which took 10 minutes, all right, by the time I got in and I clicked, give me a desktop, it said all shortcuts are disabled. And, and I have to tip my hat to this company because they did an outstanding job actually protecting the organization. I was this close to having persistence set up in that organization, calling back to me, to my attack machine, and me just taking all their data, okay? But they, they knew what was happening, they stopped it immediately, that was outstanding. Okay, which leads me to security control wins and fails. All right, we're gonna talk about this. Remember I told you we're gonna get into some of this experience? Let's, let's talk about wins. Now, I need, to, I need to frame this properly. Okay, not all the controls that I'm gonna put in the fail category are really all failures, but they, they do fail when it comes to stopping a determined intruder. That is the context, that's how I'm framing this. Not drive-by, not adware, not any of that, okay? Wins, network access control. If you have network access control implemented down to the workstation level, you are winning. And the reason I can tell you this is because when we do an internal pen test, if I have a, like a Dropbox or device that I have to get on the network, I, pr I generally have to go up to them and tell them, please put this in, the, in your data center. Or you can have me try and like find a printer and clone the MAC address and go through a whole lot of extra hassle in order to make this work. But if you have network access control implemented, that's gonna stop a lot of attacks immediately. It's a pain to implement and it's extremely costly. And I'm not talking about like some kind of massive proxy. I'm talking about down to the host level. Okay, that goes really, really far for stopping a determined intruder to get a presence or a foothold on your network. All right, second win, security awareness training, for obvious reasons. How could she have stopped me? Here's the question. There's one thing she could have done that would have just stopped me dead in my tracks. What's that? Oh, yeah, okay, there's two things. Call back, hang up the phone. Yeah, she could have been like, I don't know you, hang up the phone. All right, I did my, I'd done my homework. I, in fact, I, I even spoofed the home office. She put me on hold and verified my caller ID. Okay, so she had, decent reason to trust me, but how could she have verified with me on the phone, safely? Yeah. Okay. Look me up. Sexy. It's getting intimate. Yes. Look me up in the employee directory. Okay. She, she absolutely could have done that. Now, I, I had a name. Remember, I had a name and I had a position. Here's where I'm going with this. All she had to do was say, uh, you know, could you just tell me who your manager and your director are? I would have been like, uh... John, I have no idea. I have LinkedIn. That's all I got. So I'm sorry. Your director is actually Catherine. Goodbye. Th and that, that would have stopped me dead in my tracks. When it comes to security awareness training, we teach our users a thousand ways to say yes to everyone. Help desk, customer service representative. We want everybody to be helpful. Okay, and I got far more hilarious examples about, about help desk who were being helpful and just clicked everything we sent them. Okay, we don't give our users one way to safely say no. Not one way to say no to people on the other end of the phone without jeopardizing their job or thinking that, that, that the company's gonna reprimand them, okay? That's impossibly dangerous for security awareness training. Give your users a way to say no. Number three, frequent patching. Again, obvious reasons. Number four, account management. In the case that I described to you, in this particular case when I was doing their internal tests, I got a hold of an account that was in the built-in Active Directory Administrators group. It was an administrator on all workstations. It was powering all of their SQL instances, and it was also powering their Exchange environment. I'm like, I don't need Domain Administrator. I don't need Enterprise Administrator. I had everything I needed. And, and I, I started to get cavalier with it. Like, I, I would log in, and uh, in fact, I created a, an account uh, in Active Directory that the account was called Read the Notes. And in the notes, it said, if you find this account you've been owned, please call Jason at Centercom. And, and all they did was disable it, and they didn't call me, so I went back and re-enabled it. 
please call me. And they actually, they're like, we see you. And I'm like, okay. <clears throat> all right. And I, I didn't need to be a domain administrator. All right. Fails. Antivirus. I'm sorry. But antivirus has never stopped us. Okay. I'm not saying antivirus is bad. I don't want to leave you hopeless. Antivirus isn't necessarily bad, especially if you're dealing with, like, drive-by malware that's been in the wild for a long time. Antivirus can be very good. Okay, but here's the problem. If I'm a determined intruder, bypassing antivirus is a checkbox in Metasploit Pro, or if I'm using a tool called Shelter, I can do that for free. Polymorphic code injection, it, it, it creates a brand new hash, a new signature. You're not going to find it. Okay, antivirus is not going to stop a determined intruder from executing a payload. DLP. Uh, I, I know there's talks about DLP, and I'm hesitant to, to ding it, but I, let me put it to you this way. I've, I believe that DLP can be good. However, in the majority of instances, it is so hopelessly neutered in order to get it into production in the first place that, that it's all but useless. DLP has never stopped us from exfiltrating data ever, as far as I know. Okay, And if you did have a DLP solution, what are we going to do? I'm just going to install Dropbox. I'm going to you know, double encrypt a zip and you know, put it out there. You, it, it's so neutered from stopping data from leaving the company that, that it's all but useless for protecting your data from a determined intruder. Number three, trust in the audit. Not the auditor. I know a lot of great auditors. I'm talking about the audit. If you have an audit and the audit says, hey, patch your systems. You're like, hey, I patched my systems. Check. And that's it. And you think you're secure. You're not. Okay. Audits establish the baseline of your security. They, they establish the floor. A pen test pushes through the ceiling and shows you the things that you weren't necessarily paying attention to. Okay, so if you trust the audit to simply make you secure, and you think that by checking that checkbox you're secure, keep in mind, I don't think you are. Okay, and the last one is whatever latest appliance you're installing. <laughs> I'm probably going to put that in the fail category. Why? Because a lot of the techniques are, to a certain degree, the same. They're very similar. When it comes to executing PowerShell, did you just put an appliance that stopped PowerShell? Did you use GPO or AppLocker to block PowerShell? No. Which means I can still execute all of my payloads, even though you spend a ton of money on whatever it is that you just got. Okay, there are a few basic things that will always win over a flashy appliance. And those things that will always win are a tight security configuration. If you're using group policy to turn off NTLM v1, that goes so much further than spending a ton of money on something else. Okay, please keep this in mind. A tight security configuration will always beat an appliance, at least in my opinion. All right, last thing, wrap up on pen testing on ramp. If this is the direction you are interested in taking your career, here's something for you to pay attention to. Like I said, curiosity, learn how to code, consider getting into IT, not necessarily security. If you're brand new to this space, I would highly recommend that you move around IT for a little while and learn how servers get provisioned, learn how routers get installed, how ACL rules are developed, learn what breaks when you start making changes to production. Okay, because you need, and learn how databases work. And I, th these are all things that you need to know as a pen tester in order to be effective at what you're doing. Okay, training, go get it. I highly recommend it. If you're wondering, OSCP is a great place to start. And if you're thinking to yourself, I really don't know if I want to do this, in the now famous immortal words of Shia, please just do it. It's, it's absolutely worthwhile. I just love that picture, and I just don't know why. I, I don't know how he's bringing focus. It's, it's just happening. So, anyways. Go do it, okay? I know I said I have no time for questions, and I probably don't, so I'm just going to leave with thanks. If you do have questions, I will be out in the back. Adios.